If you've been around my channel for a while, you'll know how much I love short fiction. And Raymond Carver was an absolute master of the short story. He also wrote poetry too, but I'm gonna focus on the fiction for this video. His collection, Cathedral, was the first one of his that I read back when I was at university. And what immediately struck me about his writing was how minimal, but insightful it was. He had this way of writing about normal people with normal lives in a way that's anything but boring or humdrum. There'll be a huge amount we can learn from him, so let's get on with Raymond Carver's advice for writers. Number one, a little autobiography and a lot of imagination are best. This advice seems so straightforward and almost obvious when you first read it, but what I like about it is that it can be applied to all writers. If you're the kind of writer with a wealth of life experiences that you can draw upon and bring into your writing, then you can kind of lead with some of that experience. You'll be able to pull story from reality in a way, but just be careful you don't go too far because then you'll cross the line and it'll stop being fiction. There has to be a good amount of imagination in there as well to weave in some magic or present the unbelievable and to surprise your readers. On the other side of this, if you don't have the most life experience, especially I think this applies to younger writers, then the temptation is to shield yourself with that fantastic imagination, to create a story from nothing with no real connection to reality or your own life at all. When I was new to writing, that's exactly what I tried to do. I tried to hide my lack of life experience, as I saw it, with a creative and inventive story, and it didn't work. The story ended up feeling flat and inauthentic and it had no life. And it wasn't that I didn't know enough about the setting so it didn't feel real or that I hadn't done enough research into what the story was about so that that didn't bring it to life. It wasn't that stuff. The problem was that to protect against the story being boring, I didn't put any of myself into it whatsoever. There was nothing about how I saw the world. There was no trace of me in that story. And I don't mean write yourself into the story as an actual character, by the way. I just mean the story has to be yours and it has to come from your unique perspective. You can't be a human printer and just output a story like that. A bit of yourself always has to come out with any story that you write in order for it to have any life at all. You might think that nothing story worthy has ever happened to you. That's definitely what I thought at that time and what a privilege that is, I should mention. But that's not what this advice means, I don't think. Carver doesn't mean write about that time you fell over in the street and you felt embarrassed. I think he means weave what matters to you, what you see and feel and think about the world into your stories alongside the plot that you've imagined. In my opinion, that's what gives writing life. Number two, get in, get out, don't linger, go on. This advice came from an interview that Raymond Carver did with the New York Times in 1981 and it struck such a chord with me when I read it that I knew I had to include it. He talks about a phase in his writing when he was having such a hard time concentrating on even reading longer work, never mind writing it. Which is exactly how I feel about my own writing at the moment. The tip, get in, get out, don't linger, go on, applies to all writing I think. There's a very practical way that it can be useful to you when you're writing stories but there's also a more abstract way that it can be helpful. The practical side of this I think is useful in approaching individual stories. My mantra for creating a story or any kind of writing really is write, learn, repeat. And I think it's a similar kind of concept. It's about finishing things. It's about getting an idea, following that idea through to completion, finishing it, learning from it, and moving on. So much of what slowed me down when I was new to writing and still does to this day is assessing my own writing too much, which, when you think about it, is exactly what this channel is. I'm always thinking, is this finished? Is this good? Is there something I can add to it? There's nothing wrong with editing. Editing is in fact essential, but I'm talking about those times where you're just tinkering with your writing. You change a sentence, add something, take it out, delete the whole thing, and you end up saving the document exactly as it was before. I think that kind of thing is rooted not in wanting to make the story better, but in just a reluctance to share the writing and put it out there and call it finished. That, as I see it, is the practical side of this advice, but I think it also applies to the whole craft in a more abstract way as well. Get in, get out, don't linger, go on, I think is a good mantra for all of writing. I'm always talking about making your point with what you write. Whether that be something so simple that you initially overlooked it or something more bold and ambitious. That mantra I think could keep me on track when I'm making that point and remembering what's important about the story. Get in, don't hesitate to make your point and don't talk around it. Get out. Once you've made your point, be confident that it's made. Don't linger. Don't endlessly tinker with what you've written. Don't labour your point. Go on, take what you've learned 
and start working on something else. In my opinion, whether it's the point that you make or what's actually happening in your scene, not lingering and instead moving on, I think is good advice for pretty much everything in writing. Number three, writers don't need tricks or gimmicks. I'm against tricks which call attention to themselves in an effort to be clever or merely devious. I love this point. If you've seen any of my videos, you'll know my approach to writing is all about finding a way to affect a reader or connect with them in some way. Tricks and gimmicks, as far as I'm concerned, won't really help you do that. I've absolutely used them myself, by the way. I've planned an entire novel around one clever twist at the end without really realizing I was hoping that that twist would carry the entire book. It didn't. There's nothing wrong with twists and cleverness in writing, by the way, but I just don't think that stuff can make up the majority of a book. I think there has to be something more to it. I talk about the heart of a story a fair bit, and I know that sounds a bit lofty and pretentious, I'm aware, but I genuinely do think there has to be one. If you want to use tricks and gimmicks, I think the weight of the story should already be there. It should be able to support its own weight first before you add that stuff in. Then those tricks, if you want them, can just be embellishments to a story that already feels whole. I think what it boils down to is what you're looking for from your writing or your story. I'm looking to give a reader some kind of experience or make them feel a certain way, leave a lasting impression on them or just make them think about things. I don't know if tricks and gimmicks can really do that. Number four, I'm not interested in works which are all texture and no flesh and blood. I guess I'm old fashioned enough to feel that the reader must somehow be involved at the human level. Well, if that was old fashioned in 1985 at the time of that interview, then I'm seriously out of date at this point because I strongly agree with this. I have no interest in stories that don't make readers feel anything at all. This one goes hand in hand with the last one really, in that it's all about what you're hoping to achieve with your writing. And I think that's something that's well worth stopping to consider from time to time. And I mean really stop and think about it. My aim, as simply as I can put it, is as Carver says, to involve my reader at a human level. I wanna make a reader feel something. Thinking about why you do it, I think can give you a lot of direction with your writing. When you figure out what your actual goal is, underneath selling books and getting published, what is it really? I find that can give you answers that you didn't know you needed. And it can also help you avoid writing for the wrong reasons, even if those reasons are just wrong for you personally. What's the flesh and blood beneath it all? Number five, there has to be tension, a sense that something is imminent, that certain things are in relentless motion, or else, most often, there simply won't be a story. I like this point as soon as I read it, although I do think I interpreted it wrong the first time. I write literary crime stories mainly, so tension is something that I'm usually looking to create. I often want it to be a part of my stories. So naturally that's what I thought he was talking about. The slow build up to a conflict or how a plot or a situation can slowly get more dangerous. All of that's still true, I think. And if you write in a genre where tension would fit, then it definitely still applies. But I don't think he necessarily means tension as in conflict. I think the tension he's talking about is the kind you find in elastic. The kind of tension that comes from things wanting to change shape or from stretching things out. All stories, I think, benefit from being stretched out or closely looked at or tested to see if they hold their shape. And the phrase relentless motion is a great way to sum up what should always be happening with any story. It should always be moving forward, making progress, working towards something. There always has to be a force that's pulling it on or driving it forward, no matter what kind of genre you're writing in or what you want the speed of your story to be. A sense of something being imminent. I can't really think of a better way to make a reader turn a page than that. Number six, if you're going to describe a spoon or a chair or a TV set, you don't want to simply set these things into the scene and let them go. You want to give them some weight, connecting these things to the lives around them. I really couldn't agree more. And if there's one thing that I can't hide my dislike for in writing, it's description for the sake of description. And I know some readers love that and they absolutely want that in stories, but I'm not one of them. I definitely agree with what Carver says here. Everything you put into your story should have at least some small reason to be there. Everything should contribute towards the story, even if it's in the tiniest of ways. To clarify, it's a mistake, in my opinion, to spend loads of time describing objects when they have no real bearing on the story. But that doesn't mean that every single thing that you describe has to be absolutely involved in the plot in some way. That's also a mistake. That spoon he mentioned, for example, it doesn't have to sit on a table until the point where it's used as a murder weapon against someone. Ouch. 
That's not the kind of connection to the story that I think he's talking about. Instead, I think the things that you mention and describe just have to feel like they're a part of the lives of your characters. They're in some ways an extension of your characters rather than just pieces of your setting. The setting, as much as you might love it, is not alive. It's not a character. So furnishing it with a great number of accessories that don't really interact with anything isn't going to create much of an effect. However, associating objects and things with your characters can carry weight. There can be memories associated with them or value to them. When they sit somewhere disconnected, just being shiny, there's not really any sense of that. When you describe things, I think is also really important. Listing a bunch of stuff at the opening of a story or the opening of a chapter, not only is that a little bit boring, in my opinion, but it's also ahead of the characters. It's ahead of the reason you're writing the scene. It's ahead of the story. Even for the most important of objects, I think describing them when a character interacts with them is what gives them purpose. It's what helps connect them to the lives of the characters, as Carver says. Someone feeling the weight of a dagger in their hand has way more life to it than that dagger just sitting on a table. Number seven, it's important for writers to provide enough to satisfy readers even if they don't provide the answers or clear resolutions. This is really good advice, I think, because it takes into account different types of writers. I'm not the kind of writer that likes to specify in great detail what the outcome of my story is. If you've read anything that I've written, like my novella in Flash, Gold Fury, which I'll link down below, then you'll know I prefer to leave the outcomes of my story a bit more open. Some readers, like me, will really like that. They enjoy the fact that everything isn't wrapped up into a neat little package and there's space there for you to imagine and they like that feeling of being left wondering. Some readers though will hate that and that's absolutely valid too. If they're investing their time and their money and their energy into reading a story then they want to know how things turned out. You're the writer, tell them what happened. You can never please every reader and it's probably not a great idea to try but what you can do is try to please as many readers as possible while staying true to the kind of writer that you are. I think that's what Carver is alluding to here, providing enough to satisfy readers. It depends on the genre too. You can't very well write a whodunit mystery and at the end say it's open to interpretation. You decide who did it. Because readers are going to feel pretty cheated by that and probably throw your book at the wall. But with a literary fiction book, you can leave that ending wide open if you want to. I think what it boils down to isn't the amount of detail or the amount of loose ends you tie up or you don't. It's the shape of the ending. It might not be airtight, corner to corner with everything boxed off, but it should at least occupy enough space at the end of that story to feel like an unquestionable ending. As always, thank you so much for watching. Happy writing.